there are mountains in our lives. One of my favorites uh, happened when we were in Maui with my parents on their honeymoon. That needs a little explaining. If <laughs> so glad you're listening. <clears throat> my parents both uh, lost their first spouses um, in death and remarried. And after several days on their honeymoon, uh, brought all the children along and we joined them for our very first family vacation. It was a whole Brady Bunch thing. We were lined up on the wedding. We, we didn't take the dog. We had one. We just left him at home. Um, but it was, it was a really wonderful trip. One morning, my dad, my brother, and I uh, got up and left the hotel at 3 a.m. and drove to meet a group at the foot of Haleakala. It's a volcano on the island. We twisted up the road in an old hippie van for what seemed like an eternity. And when we got to the top, it was freezing. Now, I, I didn't know to pack uh, cold clothes to Hawaii. It was in the mid to lower 40s. There was a strong wind um, blowing from the direction we needed to face in order to see the sunrise, which after I typed that, I should have just said east. Um, <laughs> I did that at 8.30 and didn't search. So anyway, the, um, the cold air was actually very helpful to kind of uh, knock us back from the nausea from the hippie van that we rode up in. And after our stomachs settled, we walked to the edge of the volcano and we stood looking at just darkness. The crowd gets a little grumpy at that point, uh, standing there at the edge, because we've all had this awful drive. We've all gotten up at an awful morn hour in the morning and there we are looking at darkness. And eventually, after what seems like a very long time, I learned that uh, cold volcano minutes are like dog years um, so <laughs> actually wasn't a long time it just felt that way the sky began to grow lighter and we could we realized we were above the clouds and in just a few moments we began to see the the sun rise above this ocean of clouds it was breathtaking the way the sky and the clouds would change colors the way the tiny shards of light would quickly become blinding rays of orange-yellow sun. It was just amazing. And certainly a mountain in my life I will not soon forget. Our scripture reading this morning tells us about a particular mountain in Jesus' life, also in the life of a few of his disciples. It comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 26. Read, now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but when they awoke, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter didn't know what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Currently the Winter Olympics are taking place in Vancouver, Canada. And there are athletes careening down mountains on skis and snowboards and sleds. They're going over bumps and onto jumps and through gates and around trees. All in the effort to win the gold. There are mountains in their lives that they will certainly never forget. 
And we all have them, and we have them in all different kinds. We have promotions that are won or granted, become mountains in our lives. We have graduation ceremonies uh, where degrees are conferred and various honors are given. Some people mark birthdays as mountains. Some of you consider them valleys. Either way, it's fine. (laughs) They come in all sorts of variations and each in their own way rise above the landscape of our lives and dot our horizons with hope and fond memories. We have these mountains in our lives and if we aren't careful, we could easily become mountain junkies. Addicted to the high of those experiences, always looking past our present to a day when we can get to the next mountain and experience the high again. Or we may run the risk of falling prey to the temptation that Peter articulated for us when he blurted out that it was good that they were all there and they should build tents to honor this experience. Now this was more than Peter just wanting to throw up his North Face three-man tent and have a camp out and roast marshmallows and do s'mores with Moses and Elijah. He had some theological and traditional justification for wanting to build shelters, but as Luke adds in his parenthetical remark, Peter really didn't know what he was saying. He just had to say something because what he was seeing was so incredible. More beautiful and dazzling than the sun rising above the clouds on the edge of a volcano. This was God's son. Transfigured before them. Steve and I were talking about this passage earlier. And it's interesting that Luke says Peter didn't know what he was saying. Not only did he not understand his bumbling words as they were coming out. He didn't understand what he was saying about what it meant to be in that place. The conversation they were having with Jesus was about his death. And Peter says, let's camp out here. This is wonderful. We've been there. When the days are long and everything feels wrong and out of place and we hearken back to our mountaintop experience, those mountains in our lives, and we wish we'd stayed there. Wish we had built a shelter and continued to bask in the glory. But those mountains in our lives, as wonderful as they are, they're not this mountain. On this mountain, Jesus finds confirmation about his own identity. In Luke's gospel, we find Christ going onto this mountain to pray after a series of questions about just who he thinks he is. Chapter 7, he's eating with a group of people when the woman comes in and anoints his feet with nard and her tears and then wipes them with her hair. Jesus tells her her sins are forgiven. And the people who are sitting at the table with him, the ones who had been there the entire time eating and listening to what he was saying, the Pharisees, who had undoubtedly heard about the centurion's slave who was healed long distance, about the widow's son who was raised from the dead, the Pharisees, who had studied the law and the prophets, they ask at the end of their time together, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus tells several parables and as he is teaching, Luke tells us that his mother and brothers come to get him. We're not told why they want to see him, but Jesus answers the people who gave him the message by saying, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. In many ways, he's just admitted that on this earth, Jesus is somewhat of an orphan, wandering about without a family because there isn't anyone who is hearing God's word and putting it fully into practice yet. 